Our first innovator is Dr. Sarvanja Dewitty, co-founder and CEO of Angio Safe Incorporated. Dr. Dewitty is a pharmaceutical scientist with 30 years of experience in drug and medical device industry, with several products launched worldwide. Dr. Dewitty co-founded Pearl Therapeutics in 2007 and developed novel respiratory drug devices combinations raising $167.5 million despite, despite the Lehman Brothers collapse. He recruited talent from major companies and progressed three products into phase three clinical testing. In 2013, AstraZeneca acquired Pearl for $1.15 billion and funded the Pearl pipeline with another $1.5 billion. Two products have now been launched, one more approved, and others in pipeline. Currently, Dr. DiVetti is leading AngioSafe a stealth mode company developing novel catheter-based devices for totally blocked arteries in the heart and legs. I now request Dr. Divitti to come up to the stage. Doesn't work. All right, it's a delight to be with you all today. Uh, particularly with CII, uh, given the legacy that CII carries of the entire manufacturing spectrum from India of 122, 128 years actually. Uh, so it's a delight to be associated with this event. I'm grateful for Ram for giving this opportunity to share some of my stories here. So this presentation is not going to be about one company, the latest one that I'm working on. It's actually a legacy of innovation that I've had the privilege of being involved in and certain others that I've had the privilege of learning from. While this Silicon Valley, based on Silicon, has been evolving over the last 50, 60 years, when you talk about life-changing innovations, it's all elemental to me. If you look at where silicon is, it's right there. Okay. It wasn't silicon originally, as you probably know. It was the next element, germanium. It becomes unstable over 100 degrees Celsius, silicon 150. So that's when the scientists in 1950s said, let's move to silicon. That's just how the whole world started. But the world of life-changing innovations, those that deal with life sciences, deal with elements above silicon. Look at carbon, right there. Oxygen, hydrogen, these are the sources of life. So the innovations I'm going to talk about are one layer above silicon, or one layer above. Look at the next element below hydrogen, it's lithium, all electronic vehicles, etc., etc. So it's all about elements, what we do with elements, because we are all made up of these elements. So as Silicon Valley got going in 1950s and as it proliferated, as it evolved, later on using the technological innovations, a component of life sciences innovations, the biotech borough that South San Francisco is pointing to, this all came about. And I took this picture from San Jose Mercury News, by the way. So this is 2021 picture, and it's all changing. That entire valley is now what we call Silicon Valley. That changed the world, Silicon world, all over the map. But along the way, about 40, 42 years ago, I became a student of pharmaceutical sciences. And I've remained a student of pharmaceutical sciences. So let me now share with you how we have been solving problems as the silicon-based scientists and engineers have been solving the problems of information, engineering, technology, communication all over the planet Earth. This is the first set of problems I had the privilege of getting involved in. The human world, breathing impairment. People suffer from episodic closure of their airways, the right-hand side, asthma, and that condition worsens with age. That's the gradual slope. On the left-hand side is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This is chronically obstructed airways. Take a deep breath. Hold it. Now imagine going through your daily life that way. That's COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The green curve 
is life. Life is a one-way street. Your lung function declines with age. But COPD patients, they decline much faster. They lose years of their life. And the goal for the COPD patients is to try to arrest that curve as early as possible and change its slope as early as possible. These two problems have been with us for ages. Smoking, dust, pollen, chronic exposure to dust, the lungs get inserted on a daily basis. They need help and that's where back in before 1950s, you know, when germanium was still being contemplated for transistors, nebulizers were used to deliver drugs to the airways. And in about 1954, a little 13-year-old asthmatic girl named Susie complained to her father, whose name was George Mason, who was head of Riker Laboratories in Minnesota. She complained to her father, why can't I get my asthma medicine on those aerosol sprays your company makes? And that's just how the spray inhalers came about. This is before silicon became the basis of transistors, that spray inhaler was discovered. And that's the first inhaler I had a chance to work on. Not in 1950s, I'm not that old, but I'm talking about that type of inhaler. So this spray type inhaler, the first product that pra practically every COPD and asthma patient is prescribed is this one, albuterol sulfate. It's a drug that goes into the airways in a matter of five minutes it opens up the airways depending on who the patient is but mostly upper airways and it does so for about five six hours effect wears off you have to take it again so this is what's called rescue medication rescuing those airways and those were being delivered since 1950s since Susie Mason's you know uh, appeal using chlorofluorocarbons on the bottom left hand side there those are ozone depleting so in 1980s the world changed from chlorofluorocarbons to hydrofluoroalkanes so this effort became one of rescuing the planet earth as well as rescuing the patients from asthma and albuterol sulfate could not be made manufactured in these new ozone non-ozone depleting propellers. Why? Because these things contain just about 200 parts per million more water. Tiny, tiny amount of extra water in these new propellants and that just wreak havoc with the neutral sulfate. The drug would not leave the inhaler consistently. If it left the inhaler initially at the right dose, later on by second, third week, it would just go completely away. Why? Because the drug deposit on, on the wall due to that little water. One three-line email I wrote in 1993 solved that problem to the project team inside Glaxo and that became a pattern, that became this drug. So I'm very, very proud that since 1995 or so, this drug has been helping patients worldwide, even now. <laughs> even now, until last year, last few years, this, drug, this product has been making almost $500 million or more for Glaxo. And I'll tell you how this is going to become still a sustained product towards the end of my presentation. So, first product, this is life changing for those asthmatic patients, but that's all about rescue. Back in mid 80s, 90s, new drugs were being discovered that would help keep these patients, their airways healthy around the clock. Maintenance therapy. That means they would need less of rescue therapy, they can go through their life worry-free, asthma-free, COPD patients would have a lot more consistent airways. So that's that transition to Cerevent, Flovent, the first two drugs that got approved for such maintenance therapy and then combination of the two in the form of this Advair Discus and its spray version. These products have helped now 200 million patients worldwide. Uh, just an estimate and made Glaxo over a hundred billion dollars. This, this brand alone, Adware alone was a 10 plus billion dollar brand per year for Glaxo at its peak. So these kind of experiences when you see your signs reaching so many patients worldwide, it gives you the confidence to be able to go on and take more risks and that led to a few, you know, dec about a decade later to coming to Silicon Valley and launching 
a company called Pearl Therapeutics. And that was simply because my previous company's management would not let me work on particles that were low density particles that would float into the airways deep, go deep into the airways and could cover airways just as just the way smoke damages the airways throughout. And those are these little low density particles shown in the middle panel at the bottom. These are made out of phospholipids. They are hollow in structure, cheese ball like structure. So they float in the air. And if they are suspended in the liquid inside those spray inhalers, they could float into the air and go into the lungs deep. And if the drug was inside them, then the drug would go too. That's the technology I wanted to work on to replace Adware with this technology, to come up with new products. And the management said no. So we just spun this company out pearl, went to VCs, raised capital, and started working with it. And we discovered that we, if we could just take the drug crystals that actually would sink in the liquid, put these phospholipid low density particles with the crystals together, and the two of them would associate with each other. One floats, the other sinks. Both of them don't like the liquid. So they found each other and they started associating with each other and they would be delivered as these tandem particles and basically what we did was discover dandelions coming out of inhalers and this allowed us to develop products much much faster combine multiple drugs two drugs three drugs in one inhaler in an unprecedented way such that when the COPD patients would go through their declining function and when they needed multiple inhalers to get multiple drugs we could put them in one inhaler and deliver them as if they were being delivered from separate inhalers. That requirement was never met by those inhalers until we discovered this. As a result of this, we were able to advance a two-drug combination rapidly into phase three in six years' time. We raised $134 million after the collapse of Lehman Brothers. And this company was acquired by AstraZeneca in 2013, or rather our investors chose to sell us to AstraZeneca for $1.15 billion. So we became a part of AstraZeneca. They funded us with another billion and a half dollars. So I'm one of those rare few scientists whose vision fetched two and a half billion dollars in investment. Okay, and that then, that then led to AstraZeneca launching the first product, two drug combination, Bivespi, all over the world. This is about just opening up airways. The middle one contains a third drug, a triple combination. Nobody in the industry has, had figured out how to make a triple combination. Uh, we did. This triple combination and the dual combination, those two products, last year for AstraZeneca made $456 million. And this is on the way up. The third product was just approved. This is the good old Ventolin, but with butyrosinide added to it, which means nobody should get just rescue medication. They should always get the airway opener as well as airway cleaner, an anti-inflammatory agent simultaneously. And that has become the standard of treatment all over the world for asthma. So this is going to create that product. Basically, $3 billion worth of products that are individual, Ventolin or albutol sulfate only products will be replaced by this one product that was just approved in January this year. So one innovation of finding low density, high density constructs, which is sort of a biomimicry simulation in a pharma situation, we did not need to invent new drugs. We just needed to invent new delivery systems and we are still helping patients. So this is the legacy of Pearl, but along the way, I've had the, um, the luxury of learning from other inventions and that gives us confidence. I'll tell you about one invention that happened right here in Silicon Valley, in Mountain View, about a mile away from the building where the original silicon-based transistors were made, on Charleston Avenue in Mountain View on the other side of 101, at a company called Elza Pharma. Elza Pharmaceuticals, they had a range of delivery systems, but not products. One of those signs, one of their scientists, my senior from IIT BHU Pharmacy, Dr. Sunil Gupta, he was working there and he said, look, what happens with children with attention impairment, these are attention deficit disorder children who are given a drug called methylphenidate. They would be given that drug in the morning before they went to school and the drug would basically 
rise in concentration in the bloodstream and in about four hours the concentration would be dropping. So by the afternoon the children would lose their attention. And then it became a compliance issue because teachers could not administer the drug in the afternoon and then if you give a second dose it gets a peak and the third dose it took three doses to provide around the clock coverage. What Dr. Gupta and his team said, let's make using one of Elza's technologies, that technology there, where in one capsule you would have an immediate release form, the blue dose, and then the yellow dose, which would be a second dose, and the two doses would be delivered six to seven hours apart, continuously in concert, and they call the product Concerta. It became an $800 million drug on the basis of this curve, the continuous curve, Elza, Elza was sold to Johnson & Johnson for $10 billion as a result of that. After that, the buildings in which Elza stood were, were taken over by Google. So Google headquarters became, were, were taken, actually became resident in Elza buildings after that. So this is Silicon Valley ecosystem where one company, one product leads to one success and other companies, you know, occupy their spaces. One more innovation that I had a part of uh, I had a part to play in. This was in, in halfway between MIT and Harvard at a company called Alchemy's in Boston. Levodopa. It's a natural neurotransmitter present in the brain, but patients who don't have the correct levels of it, they suffer from Parkinson's disease. They are tremoring constantly and some of them freeze. This is called catatonic state. These patients, if you give them levodopa orally, it takes 45 minutes for them to, 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 to get relief from it, or maybe longer than that. So we came up with the concept of taking these particles that are like folded crevices, low density, really light particles. You could just, just, just with a little bit of a plume of air, they would float. They're really highly uh, respirable particles. Put levodopa in them, and my job was to create an inhaler that these Parkinson's patients with whatever breathing function they had could inhale these particles with and the drug would go straight into the lungs, immediately into the heart and straight to the brain from there. Because no more stomach, no more absorption, no more liver, no more bloodstream and then to the brain. Straight to the brain they would be immediately rescued. The unfrozen, this is rescue from Parkinson's. This product became in Brisa. It's already available out there. And then I'll tell you about one more product. It's actually happening now. And this is my dear friend, <coughs> Mr. Meer Imran. He is a legend in Silicon Valley when it comes to biotech uh, and, and, and medical device innovations. So they came up with this concept of, of a robotic tablet. They call it a robotic pill. And how did they do it? This is absolutely magnificent innovation. Mir Imran's younger brother is Mir Hashim. So Mir Hashim is a nociception, pain receptor expert. And he tells that the intestinal area past duodenum, this is stomach, past duodenum, in this part of the intestines, there are no sharp pain receptors. You could inject a needle and you would not feel it. So they said, okay, let's figure out a way of injecting biologics there, injecting insulin, injecting human growth hormone and not through the skin. How do we do it? Well, they discovered a tablet, a capsule, inside which there is a mechanism that can take this organic compound needle. It is not metallic needle. This is made out of dext dextrose, etc., etc. You put the drug inside it. And then this entire mechanism is trapped inside the capsule. This capsule is pH sensitive. So look at the pH right there. When the pH is acidic, it doesn't get hurt. But then when the pH becomes alkaline, in, this, in the intestinal area, the capsule starts to break up. And the mechanism of injecting this needle into the wall of the intestine is activated, the needle goes into the wall which is heavily perfused. If you took your gastrointestinal system, the intestines and spread them out, it's like one football field size surface area. High surface area, heavily perfused organs, they get an injection effect 
without pain, replace injections, and they are advancing this technology rapidly and through, through a variety of different candidates. So another innovation. And this then gave me the confidence of tackling the next problem, which is blood flow impairment. Because all my life I had worked on airway impairment, but when you see entrepreneurs solving different types of problems, you can tackle different problems. So this is an issue that's the, that's the human world when it comes to blood flow impairment. Look at the map here, North America, Asia, etc. The number of patients that suffer from cardiovascular disease burden are shown in this plot. There are 450 million patients who suffer from coronary artery disease. Coronary arteries are the ones that are sitting on the heart like a crown. So those are the ones that are shown in the left panel, or the peripheral artery disease, the leg arteries, and there are total 400 million patients. And these arteries get blocked as a result of smoking, diabetes, age, uh, uh, hypertension, excess weight, sedentary lifestyle, high cholesterol. These are factors that are prevalent worldwide. These patients, about 20% of them will have their arteries totally blocked, 100% blocked. And these total blockages are a nightmare for doctors. They get scared. Only about 20% of interventional cardiologists actually treat these arteries for the heart. And leg, the, the physicians get a variety of different outcomes. The main problem is that this total blockage is basically a tissue stuck inside a blood vessel and the tissue is never consistent. The length is different, the artery sizes are different, they are in different tortuosities, they have calcium or not, which means their hardness is variable. These tissues could have a single gram puncture force to several hundred gram puncture force. And physicians are going in blind, not really knowing what they are going to encounter. And therefore it affects how long does it take for them to go through these blockages. But if you have a partial blockage, like this one here, they could weave a wire through the opening and use the wire as a rail and send in a balloon to open up this plaque, again by compressing the plaque against the vessel wall, and the work is done quickly. But when it comes to this total blockage, you have to first put that rail, the wire, through. And doing so is basically pushing at the end of a rope, 14 thousandths of an inch, a third of a millimeter thick, from outside the body on a beating heart or on the other side. This is a nightmare. This has remained a long-standing problem. The first time it was attempted to be solved was by surgery in 1928. That became the bypass surgery in 1960, just about when silicon-based transistors were going gangbusters. Okay, and then in 1977, angioplasty came out, the plastering the plaque against vessel wall for opening. But total blockages still, a lot of patients are sent for bypass surgery inappropriately. A lot of patients in the legs suffer to the point where their tissue has died and they suffer from amputations. Several hundred thousand just in the US alone. Our expectation is at NGOSAVE, that's the company I'm building now, I have the privilege of building now, and Ram is a co-founder, where is Ram? Uh, with a physician who came to us, and this physician's name is Dr. Malik Thatipelli. So he originally wanted to become an engineer, he became a general surgeon, then he became a vascular surgeon, and combining those three brains in one, he came up with the concept of cutting through this tissue as if conducting a general surgery through this tissue at the end of a catheter with a centering system that will keep this cutting system controlled. That was the idea in November of 2013. Ram, Malik and I, we launched this company in 2014 and we have a family of catheters now that are going to replace this mess. This is what industry has created over the last 50 years or so. 30 different wires in the middle, bunch of micro catheters, other devices. Physicians have taken these and figured out a way of putting some algorithms around it. There are almost 2400 permutations and combinations on this screen. We would replace those with one catheter per blood vessel segment in the body with this mechanism that I just described, basically assimilating all needs of these interventions, the anatomy, the procedural challenges and the physician's struggles, all in one offering. 
simplify and democratize these in inventions. We have been working on it in total stealth mode for the last eight years. We, have, we don't believe in metering out a little bit of information because we know anticipation brings no value. What we really need to do is finish this job and get it out there. So we are about six months away from getting our first catheter for intervention in the big blood vessels above the knee. These are 80% of the patients suffering from the leg blockages. Next is below the knee vessel, uh, 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 catheter. Next is coronary catheter. And then a real game changer. These two catheters, longer version of them going from the wrist to the leg. Basically, patients would get their leg pain relieved and they would walk off from the cath lab table back to their ward or back to their home. That's our vision. This, I think, is going to change this complete landscape. It's going to reduce the number of bypass surgeries. It's going to reduce the number of amputations. And if these patients redevelop these blockages, we expect those re-blockages to be also just as easily open. So as we discuss this, there is one more thing that happened in the last couple of years, which is this major flu that showed up called COVID. About 1995, I was involved in this product at Glaxo called Relenza, the first inhaled anti-flu drug. But it's precise, it's actually for, for seasonal flu only. It really doesn't do the job. So now, last year, NIAID, Dr. Fauci's organization at NIH, uh, declared a funding of nine centers in the United States worth about $588 million. One of those centers is a 69 million center at Stanford University, AVID, Antiviral Drug Discovery Center, led by Dr. Jeffrey Glenn, who is a gastroenterologist. But his team is developing a range of compounds, new drugs, with new mechanisms to tackle basically all sorts of viruses and have these drugs ready such that when the next time the pandemic shows up, the national viral defenses are strong. And I have now the fortune of associating with this center as an external advisor. So I'm helping them put together the entire infrastructure of developing these inhaled versions of their products for delivery to whatever regions they need to go into. Perhaps broad spectrum antivirals, perhaps a broad aerosol property. The entire team of inhalation experts I'm helping them put together around this while building NDOCs. So when you are in Silicon Valley, you look at all this innovation around Silicon Valley, but these are the kind of learnings that we can take from all aspects of entrepreneurism, whether it's technological, whether it's biological, whether it's pharmacological. In my field, the first thing we need to do is really understand the clinical challenge, understand the disease, understand the nature first. And then solving those, use the principle number one, which is work with nature use nature. That's what my professor in Canada, Dr. Alan Mitchell, taught me. Don't ever fight nature. It's the best scientist ever. All, all of the patterns are basically already nature's discoveries. We discover them and we call them our own, but they are all nature. So work with it and never give up. You just, if, you, if you're failing, you just haven't understood enough. So work with nature and understand it at a deep level. That gives you the confidence to enter the, take the entrepreneurial risks. Because this is highly risky in terms of taking somebody's <coughs> money, putting it in you behind your idea, they are trusting your credibility, your execution matters. Stay patient in failures, in, in difficult times, and always fight the urge to give up. If you know there is a problem to be solved, figure a way out. Um, in, for the entrepreneurs, my message simply to them is, look, if you focus on dilution, you are not, never going to be able to finish a job. Focus on value creation. As long as the slope of the value creation curve is steeper than the slope of the dilution curve, everybody wins. So that is, that's key. And then ultimately, what we do in my, my line of work is we perceive human cause. Because, we, because the, the, the work we do is so powerful that it helps fellow human beings at, in, 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 in the ailment of the most prized possession they have, which is their body. And we are not even there. That's how personally we impact them without even being there. So this is the primary goal. We need to stay focused on that. 
Because without that, we won't be able to solve clinical problems. Wealth creation is just a side effect of clinical value creation. And that, I think, is the last message I'd like to, to leave you with. So, when you think of Silicon Valley, and as we establish this evolved construct, and as we use this to build bridges with a, a huge ecosystem in India, consider Silicon Valley as a source of uh, ideas in technological as well as pharmacological, biological, medical spaces as well. So with that, let me stop here. Thank you so much for the opportunity.